bull talk. Yeah, exactly. That's lovely. And uh, yeah, I think what we're going to do is tell them stories about the past, about the jockeys, about the horses, things that people don't know. This is not about MJ Wurrendal and MJ Wurrendal racing stables. Yes, my sponsors will get mileage out of it, but this is bull talk. This is talking about behind the scenes as it happened. I think that's the thing with bull talk. We're going to talk it as I remember it. And that is something Anthony Del Pesce has taught me, which is invaluable. You know, it's great to have these people around you to help. And I've been a little bit stubborn. I have tried to carry everything on my own. And I've got all these people around me to do those things. My job is to train horses. And it's time now. Shaya Skati, Baba. And Taryn's job is to manage you. That's Taryn and Uncle Brom. Yeah, Uncle Brom said the other day he needs gloves. Uh, they manage me. But my mate said to me yesterday, hey, it's now time to stop talking and showing. The horses must start winning. We're going to keep this bull talk about the past, about obviously the, the subject today is going to be around London News. You're going to ask the questions and I'll shoot. Bottom Bullseye. Line. Bullseye, London News. The most famous horse in South African history for the simple reason that he did what no other horse has ever done. He flew from Cape Town to Joburg to Hong Kong via Amsterdam in 47 hours and he won the QE2 Cup. We've had horses go overseas like Horse Chestnut, Colorado Kings. See, you, that's, that's why I've got you. Yeah, you were still in your dad's bag. Or you were in Baghdad, one of the... Hey, Baghdad. Baghdad, right. So, a lot of people don't know that London News ran on seven different race tracks in his first seven appearances in South Africa. You were working for him at the time that London News went into the Vodacom Durban July, which in those days was still the Rothmans July, and we all knew Pierre Stratham was riding him. The preparation of London News was left in your hands. Thank God days. it was left in my hands, otherwise you would never have run in the July. And there was a simple reason, you can ask Alec Laird. He was actually aim aiming him at another race uh, that season. And the same thing happened to me, and he got scratched because he got injured. And what I'm talking about is two days before the July, now, I remember Alec Lees, he's got him spot on. We, we are on target. Mr. Laurie Jaffe paid me 10,000 Rand those days. A lot of money to work this horse for him. In 1996, that was a bucket load of money. Hey, yeah, yeah. And the best is, you know, that's why I say I'm going to veer off a little bit. I was in my third year and I, I was riding for Mr. John Nicholson. And he trained for Mr. and Mrs. Jaffe, the extraordinary two people in, you know, they stamped in South African racing. And, uh, you know, at that stage I came from a farm and uh, I used to smell Smith. If you ask me how do you spell Smith, I used to say with two Fs. And my accent was so bad at the time that Glenn Schofield, even Anthony Del Pesce, we have the honor to sit in his restaurant, Butler's, they mocked me. and. I was riding for Mr. Nicholson and he gave me instructions. So, with a heavy Afrikaans accent, um, obviously we spoke about the race in front of Mr. Jaffe and Mrs. Jaffe and uh, afterwards he said to, to them, because I was, I was very bright as a kid, I did very well at school. So he says to Mr. and Mrs. Jaffe, a smart young fellow this, very bright, and under her breath, I could understand English very well. And I heard Mrs. Jaffe say, well, he hides it very well, doesn't he? And, uh, all lost in translation. All, all, lost, all, all lost in translation. And didn't get, she didn't get it. No, no, nor did I. What was the horse? Star's Roll was Miles' name. And I'll never forget, Gavin Van Zyl comes past me on a horse called Tungsten for Uncle Joe Joseph. Uncle Joe. He comes past me. He says, right, lighty. Yes, and I'm scrubbing away, scrubbing away. Zik. On the line, I nailed him. I've got a photo that we'll actually pull out of the archives. I've got it in my book. I looked at it the other day. But talking about that morning of London News, now I'm sprinting him up. Final sprint up, massively important. On target, mate. This is pinpoint. This is bullseye. And obviously, he had a sprint up. And it took me a bit of time to bring him back. You know, he, he was a big fella. So I brought him back. And on the top track, we didn't have an exit at the 600 at the time. You had to come back. To about the 800 and I was at about the 600 650 and two lighties came onto the top track 
no control. And here they come. And London News is breathing fire and blowing smoke. And I know he's going to duck. So I waited and I timed it till they were, and I spun London News around, feet out the irons, dropped him three on his ass, and the, the two lighties came and I sprinted, and then I just eased him up again, you know? Because he would have been T-boned. Small things like that. That was so crucial to, to the July. And I loved Mr. Jeffy's business card. Didn't have much on it there. Director of businesses, that's it, Laurie Jeffy, you know, and that, that, that was marvelous. But um, a very fancy office. Did you ever go to the office? No, 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 I just got the cash. No, no, I just got the cash and I got the phone calls in the evenings, you know, uh, just to check how the horse is doing, son, you know, is he all right, you know, is, you know, is everything all right? Mr. Jeffy, it's spot on. You have to face reality. Um, Pierre Stradham is a better jockey than me. Pierre Stradham probably is maybe the best jockey I've ridden against, you know? Mais Roberts, Jeff Lloyd, Anthony Delpez, Garth Puller, Felix Kutsi, uh, all those names on the South African Championship are legends, right? I didn't quite have the talent to beat some of them, but I could work like a machine. I was light, determined. As Mark de Kock said one day, he said, you're probably the hardest working jockey in the world I've seen. If we can combine you with Stradom, we'll have, we'll have a superstar. Well, they say there's a very fine line between genius and insanity. And we know that you're very close. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm very close to genius, which was proven when they tested my IQ. But we also know that my marbles aren't always, you know what I mean? Anthony Del Pesh, we were called the awesome foursome. Me, Anthony, Anton, Sean Cormack. And then Stewie, um, because Stewie always had meetings. But the four of us, we used to go out together and, 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 and have a, at, you know, we were lighties at the time and, and we were riding well. And, you know, it was the whole scene, which was great, you know. Anthony used to buy the girls roses at, it, it, in the evenings. And Sean Cormack sometimes ate some of the roses. Anton Marcus always ate. I used to only eat half my food. Anton ate the other half. Um, that's why he's probably still sweating. Um, so it was a very unique, tremendous growing up with these guys. And we were all very talented in our own way, you know. Um, I was probably the best horseman. You come from the plus. Mm. And I happen to have had the, the privilege of meeting probably the greatest mentor that any young man can have in Oum Obas. And that's where you learned bush traditional racing. Yeah, you know, when people say bush racing, you think, ah, oh, bush racing. It was very organized. The tracks were very good. And um, I, I think I started riding for Oum Obas in, when I was nine or ten. And, and we used to go, he gave me a little white dock. And we used to go to meetings where there weren't weights. Because I, I weighed about 18 kilos and I rode with a dock. So as the flag start went, gone. But then when Obas got a, a horse called Bursian, his real name was actually Gideap from Bloemfontein. That made us famous because we cleaned up with that horse. Wherever we went, we won with him. And then the way they betted was, they sold every horse in the race. You buy a horse, then all the money goes into the pool. So whoever bought my horse and I won, to take the pool money. You know, that was the, there wasn't betting, but there was pool buying, which, which created a, a great atmosphere in everything. Um, four days before I came to the academy, um, my, my dad still said to me, MJ, Lighty, you can't ride at this meeting because you're going to the academy in four days time. Um, it was the 1st of December. I had six rides, five winners, and on the bend, there were flags. In the straight, there was a fence. So, on the sixth winner, as we, before he swung for him, Willem bumped me this side of the fence. So you were disqualified? So, I actually won the race, but I was disqualified, you know? So, um, so, so I grew up with horses. Anthony comes from the Seychelles. His father was one of the highest ranking military. Um, 
I think that's where Anthony's discipline comes from, you know, he, and, and he's a superstar in that way. I was maybe the better horseman. I could work harder. Anton is a great rider. Pierre, absolute genius. I mean, great. where have you heard of a jockey that wins championships and he hasn't ridden work for 20 years? I don't even think Frankie can say that. So it was, I remember with the championship I won. We had three months to go, and I was riding for uh, Roy Magna and Paddy Crayer. And Paddy went to Mr. Magna and said, you know, said to him, listen, the kid is burning. Let's give him off at work. Because those, those days, I used to go off 20 horses and 25 race meetings. So they gave me off. Andrew Fortune phones me. He was done and dusted at the time. They suspended him for life. Amy, I'm a man of the cloth now, you know. I said, Andy, brother, we've grown up together, don't come with that bull. I did say to him, don't come with that bull, with the extra actor in. And he said to me, I'll never forget it. He says, do you stutter? I said, no. He says, now listen to me. You are too hungry for the championship. You're letting them go too early. He says, count to three. With that, and the fact that Mr. Magna and Paddy gave me, I didn't have to ride work anymore. This has now just boosted me. I rode 27 meetings in a row. And I put 20 between me and Pierre. And that was done and dusted. Mark Khan came with a massive rattle at the end with Jeff Woodruff and Gavin Smith were on fire. But uh, my name is on there. And it'll be on there forever. And you know what, I, I might not have been the most talented rider, but I got my name on, on there through pure, pure hard work, dedication and drive. But at the same time, you know, I used to get on the plane with six computer forms in my, I bought a, like an ostrich briefcase, you know, because all the businessmen had a briefcase. So I thought, yeah, like it. Because the year I won the championship, I made a promise. You know, I wore a suit and a tie to every single race meeting. So I had my briefcase with all my computer forms. And the jockey has to, if, if you want to go to that level, you've got to know every race was in the race every jockey that's riding it, their colours, everything. Because if you've got eight in front of you and there's four behind you, you've got to know who they are, how they're going to pan out. Are you sitting behind a horse that's going to take you all the way to where you want to pull out and go? Are you sitting behind a horse that's going to battle getting into the straight where you've got to move off? So I knew where everybody was. I would know if a horse could take me where I wanted to go. I would know if Pierre was on a horse that hangs to the left or to the right. I mean, I had the privilege of riding. We had an era of riders. Our seniors were Mace Roberts, Jeff Lloyd, Felix could see, Garth Puller, um, Carl Nicias, Basil Marcus, and then, you know, just below us there was Douglas White, which brings me back to London News. London News changed lives. Because Frankie, as you know, was supposed to ride him in the Queen's Plate. And Frankie got piles which some jockeys get, you know. Um, I got it, Glenn Hatt got it because of all the riding. And Frankie couldn't make it. I think that's what Buddy Maroon died of, actually. Yes, he did. He went into an... I had the same... I also nearly, I walked out of the hospital, I weighed 44 kgs. Because of the, the operation I had, my stomach um, turned and blocked. The same happened to Buddy. So he, he actually got septicemia. septicemia inside, you know. Luckily, I was in the hospital with superstars, Prof. Hein van der Valt, you know, um, I mean... Is he from Scotland? Uh, yeah, yeah, Prof. Hein is from Scotland. But Prof. Hein van der Valt spends half his time in, in, in America and wherever. An absolute genius of a doctor, uh, put me back together a couple of times, also ended up... He was the one that picked up what was wrong with me, because when he went through his files, I weighed 51, 52, 51, 52, until I got massively ill, I was in semi-unconscious state for six months and when he saw I weighed 65 that's when th the puzzle came together you know the last six months of my career riding I wasn't riding well I remember my last ride was for Mr. Campbell and uh, the horse carried 60. I was sitting in the in the sweat box, sweat box and, and Anton and them Anton got you know the, the the heavier riders like Dutchman what are you doing here you know you 49 48 50 and I, I said, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not eating, I'm sweating. Get up and get on. 
And, and, but as I said, the interesting with the London news is, I remember Douglas White. Those days we were Wednesday, Saturdays, remember? He had a full book of rides in Durban. He got off every horse. Went down, rode London News in the Queen's Plate, rode him in the Met, Hong Kong, has never looked back. And now me and, me and White is in competition. Our competition is to see who first gets to the Melbourne Cup, you know? Um, I've always had a very, very big interest in the Arlington Million, but like a mate of mine said to me yesterday, Baba, Shaya Skati, the horses must do the talking. Look, the reality is that we know that a lot of great trainers have reached their peak in their mid-60s, 70s. I'm not going to go through the names, but the accumulation of knowledge is phenomenal. So you've still got time on your side, but the point is you need to attract new owners. You need to attract... No, no, I didn't. Michael the Cock told me. He said to me, Dutchman, you don't have time. You f I'm gone over 50. I've learned enough riding for Michael the Cock, Alec Laird, Brian Cherry, Michael Airy, Herman Brown, David Payne, Mrs. Hemming, uh, you name it, you know. So I got a lot of knowledge from there, the horsemanship on this side, and now I've got to produce the results, you know. My sponsors, Dasha and Hollywood, has really helped a lot, you know, especially Dasha. Vili has really come to the party, you know. I'm advertising Dasha products, but Vili is supporting me in a very, very big way. We've got a couple of very smart horses. You know, Vili said to me, MJ, take your time. So I've backed off him because he can be a difficult horse. And, but he's a very, very good horse. He's shown that. So now the art is for me to get him to next year's July, for him to carry as little weight as possible and have him right on the day. I was in, very involved with, with Michael the Cock because Michael always paid tribute to those who worked hard. So he always gave me the light rides and not throwing a bone. He gave you proper rides. You know, he, when, when he gave me light, I flew down to Durban often for one ride at 50. At 7 to 10 and I came home lonely. So I had the privilege of working with these guys and, and this is the knowledge, Shayaskati, that I must now produce. I think as you go, before I went to the academy with Obas, when I was in the academy, Mr. Saunders, when I came out of the academy, Mace Roberts, Mr. Cherry, later on, Mr. Payne, Jeff Lloyd, um, Anthony Del Pesce's dedication, you know, you can't always single anybody out. My uncle Gori, who loved horses, my dad, although he wanted me to go and study, seriously, they, they were not keen on me becoming a jockey. Like Pierre? I'm not sure about him. I don't think he's as bright as me. You get dom, dom or straight dom. So, no, my IQ still, no, he doesn't come close to me. But, yeah, he's a better jockey than me. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know what, you've got to face up with the facts. But as I say, you get profound people in your career that as you go alters it, you know. What people don't understand, jockeys have extreme highs and extreme lows. So eventually, you know, over a 38 year career, you learn to suppress your emotions. You learn to suppress that, you know, because it's a up and down. And um, I went to the farm and I came back not emotional, but you know, on, on, on Monday I just broke down and, and I went to races and the bloke that I opened up to was Mr. Mike De Host, you know. He was, he was the shoulder I lent on and I gained a tremendous amount of was knowledge. Was that to do with the passing of your father? Yes. I never dealt with it. Um, I even went to the farm, I saw my mum emotionless and everything. And I'm so glad everything came out and I phoned my mother and you know, we spoke for an hour, hour and a half. And I cried, I broke down, and, and for the first time, it's strange because we don't often let this out. You know, as, as jockeys, let's go to the Frankie story. The man that, probably one of the few men in the world to have the privilege of spraying the queen with champagne. A year later, he was banned for six months for cocaine. And as I believe, he, he rode 46 horses without winning. And 
he went into a bit of a depression and then that morning his wife said to me, hey, you've always told me how good you are. Go show me. And my mate said that to me yesterday. So it's time now for me to, to, to pull out the goods. And it was great that I could speak to the Mr. Haas, to Vili. That's the reality of things. And that's where my, my mate George Herman said to me yesterday, you cannot mix emotions and finances. That's why I got Vili to handle the, the farm situation. That's why I'm getting people now to help me with all other things. So when I walk now into the ring, I do one thing, I train racehorses. And I don't ride work in winter because I'm, I'm too sore, you know, with, with the, uh, my body, I've broken 19 bones, I've had 24 operations. We also got to think of those chaps who didn't make it. Yeah. We always talk about us who made it. You know, we started off 31 guys in our year. In the end, there were three left, me, Gunther, and and, and, and Donovan Habib. Donovan came back after two hip replacements. Horst Turner, the vault smashed his knee. Gunther, I think, broke both his wrists. Lucky the lock has got his, after he broke his kneecap in six places, got his leg bashed in. So, I always say, you don't get, you don't get ex-jockeys. You get jockeys who can't ride anymore. Because 90% of us are, get sidelined by injury. I mean, look at the great Anthony Del Pesce. Not long before Anthony fell, a month before that. You know, I thought about this whole scenario about Anthony, the superstar, and everything that we've all gone through. I've, I've fallen myself to pieces. And yeah, he's broken a couple of bones, lost some of his teeth, but in general, quite a clean career. And boom, broke his neck. Lucky to be. The Anthony we still know. He still walk around. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, Anthony's like my brother. His father was like my... Well, he was your brother-in-law. Yes. But before that, we grew up in the academy as brothers. His father, Claire Del Pesh, was an absolute superstar. He was, a, he was an amazing man. His mother, the most gentle person in the world, you know. Um, I mean, my people stayed a long way away, so... In the beginning, my mom and dad came down every second weekend in my second year. In my third year, every third weekend and then less. But I used to go stay with Mays, Jeff, but Anthony's home was my home. And his father was like my father at the time and, and took us in, you know. My dad on the farm followed me everything, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud to say that I've had a massive amount of people in my career that's, that's guided the unguided missile to where I am today, you know, because we all know I was a bit of a wild child and, and but you know what? That was part of my winning the championship. You know, I, I, I'd go through gaps that, that weren't there. I fell because of gaps that weren't there, but that was MJ Woodendahl and, and a massive amount of people have had influence in my life. And now bullseye racing is coming. What's going to happen here? No one knows. This is something that maybe should have been created long ago. Everything happens at the right time, at the right place, at the right moment. Just have faith and be patient. You know, I, I've, I've had the privilege to speak to a lot of superstar trainers all over the world. And the two things that come out of there, discipline, and patience. I never knew you had to be very disciplined to be patient because if a horse, some horses take time. Look, with COVID I felt six months behind because I was scared because of my, my illness that, you know, so we fell up. Compromised. A, yes. So, so, yes, it's now time for these horses to start showing. But I also believe these horses are going to carry on because as Mr. Millard said, what you take out at two, you don't get back at three, four or five. And it's going to be very interesting to see Australia, who is this country that bred these magnificent horses. They've gone back, they're breeding two-year-olds. And at the moment, they're getting lashed by, by the Europeans in the Melbourne Cup. Because these old blokes are bringing horses, late maturers, stayers. So, Japan. But the whole, the whole campaign, the whole Easter festival and the whole summer carnival, it's all geared to speed. 
it's it's geared to speed and too early. It's quite ironic. We, uh, We're the, the most famous races, the Melbourne Cup. You know what? Well, two miles. You know what amazes me? I'd like to meet the Oak, who designed the race courses in Australia. They got three, four hundred meters straight. Oh, yes, you had to do it at Charlton because you don't have yeah, space. It's about pace. Well, no false rail. No, but I mean, Genuine to be race. honest with you, we all know Turfentine. The best stamina, true top stayer, or the best horse wins the race because it's a tough track, it's a long straight. The bloke who designed the race courses in Australia, mate, it's not like they haven't got space. They could build 800 meter straights. So, so, yeah, all right, fair enough. There's no false rail and it's interesting racing and everything like that. But I think it's, it's, it's been proven all over the world now that you've got to take care of your older horses as well because, hey, that's what wins the 40, 35, 20 million dollar races. You know? I don't... You sound like Jacob Zuma. 40, 35, 20 million Zuma. I mean, listen carefully. Okay, I'm talking about the Dubai Cup that I think is going up to 40 million. The Saudi Cup that they've put up to 35 million no, got it. Because, because they want it to be bigger than Dubai. Now Dubai is going, you know what I mean? There's the Arlington Million, which is five million dollars. Then there's all those, the Breeders' Cup, you know. These are races, most of them are for older horses. And Japan is evident in showing they breeding stamina. So is Europe. And London News, get back to him. A superstar. Speed that stays. Mr. Kuna taught me that. Speed that stays. If you take the Saudi Cup, those blokes jump out at the 2000 on a dirt track that you don't want to be behind. Because it actually cuts. You bleed here under your glasses. That's how bad the kickback is. Those horses jump out and you know. Normally, the top three horses sits in the first half. I mean, uh, there, there, are, there are going to be the Zenyatas that's going to come through and off the pace. But in reality, speed that stays for those races. Europe, different story. I think America, a great opportunity to go take them on on grass tracks. Why? They cater and breed for sand. <coughs> Excuse me. They cater. And that's no bull. That's no bull. Look at, <clears throat> I mean, Royal Academy, when Lester rode him um, in America, I mean... The Breeders' uh, Cup. Um, no, 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 it wasn't the Breeders' Cup. Uh, um, we'll get on the race, you'll get the info. But anyway, as I start turning for home, you know, you know, you got the Yanks, ACDC with the one lower down, and here you got Mr. Piggott. The odd character that's tall, sitting short, and he and, them down the and the bloke said, "For those who are on um, Mr. Piggott, who are worried, it certainly doesn't look like he is." And he just sat there, stone cold, came through, boof, boof, on the line, got them. One of the greatest rides you can see, JJ the jet plane, when Pierre won on him, the Hong Kong sprint. One of the greatest rides we've seen by both South African jockeys. Yeah, Felix as well. Both South African trained. Yeah, to, to think of it, um, Pat Shaw and, and, and Lucky Udalakis. So, so, this is going to be no bull. We're going to have fun in this story and you know what, I'm gonna, we're going to go behind the scenes in some stuff. Where, as I said, London News changed lives. Douglas White. Douglas probably had a big influence on my career as well because he organized me when I was in a dull in South Africa when somebody had to slap me out of it. He got me the job in Macau. Wasn't a good job, wasn't an easy bloke. You know, he fired me. I st stood by the rails for six days without a bloke coming to offer me a work right. And Mr. Kim Chung came. Um, it was uh, J249, a grey horse, I forgot his name. And I used to watch him work. And there was a big race coming up and, and he, had fifth, he had bottom weight, 114. And he came to me and he said, would you like to, and I've been watching the source work. I said, Mr. Chung, thank you. Um, Ki Hing Toys, the owner who makes the toys for McDonald's all over the world, 
uh, I rode, I won the race. Boom. I ended up riding in Hong Kong as well, but we'll go on. That was another chapter. They, they forgot to close my stomach up. It was just, uh, I, I, the staff called me in there and he said to me, MJ, you're not riding to what we know. We've gotten to know you. You're not a, you're a very straightforward bloke with integrity, but you're not riding like you can. And I couldn't. I mean, I, I rode with a, a back brace the wrong way around to keep my guts in place. Um, but we'll keep that for another time. And that's noble. Um, but we're going to have fun here. Um, this was probably one of the more serious interviews we're going to have. And from here on, uh, we're going to excite the people. Let's draw back. This, this conversation here with London News might bring back the close race goers that have just sort of... And then we'll go broader where we're, we're going to invite younger people to start getting interested in, in, in this whole professional... Athlete, athletes that we train, these equine athletes, superstars. I mean, Secretariat is known as, I think he's number 26 on the list of all American superstars. Uh, equine, including human beings. Include, yes, equine athlete. You know, he, 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 they're they athletes. And this is where we go from here. We're going to have fun, and that's noble. That's